This is In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. There's a lot to get to in this hour, but first we're diving into the legacy of indigenous activism. In the 1960s, young indigenous people began to fight for greater recognition and rights to self-determination for their tribes. It was known as the Red Power Movement and happened at the same time as young black people were developing similar concepts in the Black Power Movement. One significant action young activists took was the occupation of Alcatraz. In 1969, dozens of indigenous activists moved onto the island that was home to the closed prison. They stayed there for over a year, alleging the government was violating its commitment in the Treaty of Fort Laramie to return out-of-use federal land to the local tribes who inhabited the area. The occupation was one of the earliest examples of indigenous activism, but it also led to the FBI and federal intelligence agencies targeting activists. National correspondent Elizabeth Ruiz was able to talk with a photographer who captured scenes from the occupation and one Native American who attended. Here are their stories and how they've spurred a half century of indigenous activism. About 10 minutes, line up. Most people are familiar with Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay for its history as a federal prison, but we're about to head to the island to tell you about a 1969 occupation that historians say influenced a Native American movement that still inspires activists today. There's the possibility of encountering rough water. Surrounded by strong currents and cold water, the island of Alcatraz was designed to imprison some of the country's most notorious criminals. But the penitentiary shut down in 1963. Get the All right. Six years later, in 1969, Eloy Martinez stepped foot on the island to participate in a Native American occupation. All right, all kinds of new stuff out here. It's now a key part of the island's history. Eloy, I've incorporated you into my walking tour. All right. I talk about the restor restoration of the water tower uh -huh. in 2019 and how you were one of the people involved. Appreciate it. Thank you. Historians say Native Americans chose to take the island because of an 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie that allows the indigenous people to occupy land abandoned by the federal government. Yale professor of American studies Ned Blackhawk says Native Americans were demanding reparations for what had been taken from them start trying to think through how do we articulate what we want in relationship to these current government policies as well as the future of an Indian world that we would like to inhabit. Blackhawk says the federal government had passed laws in the late 1940s and early 1950s that called for tribal nations to be terminated. It was known as the era of assimilation. That's what you did all day long, man. Follow the rules. Today, Eloy visits often. His hope, he tells me, is that the occupation is never forgotten. He points out the welcome sign that was painted by Native Americans soon after they arrived on the island. How are you doing? Yes, and they said they wanted something controversial. You know, and I said, why are you going controversial? Paint that sign back up. Because everybody will have to say, what the hell is that? Why is it there? And that's exactly what they do, you know. Eloy says nostalgic feelings flood back every time he returns. Free. It was free. Happy. Yeah. Because people were doing things, you know. I mean, it was, it was fresh. Nothing, nothing like that had ever happened anywhere else. He often returns with his good friend Ilka Hartman. And this one, you can see the energy, you know. She's a photographer who was born in Germany during World War II. She says the genocide Native Americans faced during the gold rush in the U.S. reminded her of genocide during World War II. You could barely see her white pants, it was so foggy. Igniting her passion to stand up for marginalized communities. I was trying to show them with their pride and their success. She captured all of these photos during the 19-month occupation. They are now on display at an exhibit on the island that she hopes becomes permanent. Very amazing that all this work is still alive. Only about 89 indigenous men, women, and children seized the land, but as Black Hawk states, they also seized the nation's attention. And for the first time really in the 20th century, Native Americans land literally on the front pages of the national headlines and newspapers. Change did happen. Termination policies were ended. Indian Child and Welfare Acts were enacted. Religious Acts were enacted. And that would have never happened 
if Alcatraz hadn't happened. Sacred land is still being returned to native tribes today, a revolution they say started with the Alcatraz occupation. Elizabeth Ruiz, Scripps News, San Francisco. All right, many thanks to Elizabeth for highlighting their experiences. After the Alcatraz occupation, the FBI targeted the American Indian Movement, or AIM. They sought to address poverty, discrimination, and help Native Americans fight for the rights promised to tribes in treaties with the federal government. Monday, February 6th, marks 48 years to the day of the arrest of one of the American Indian Movement's most famous members, Leonard Peltier. Peltier, an activist of Lakota and Dakota descent and an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, is the longest held indigenous prisoner in the U.S. Activists have spent years advocating for the release of the now 78-year-old man. In 1976, he was arrested and later convicted for the killing of two FBI agents on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Peltier has admitted to participating in the shootout, but the evidence used to convict him has issues. One witness who signed an affidavit said she was Peltier's girlfriend and saw him kill the agents. She later recanted and said she had never met him. We spoke with another witness, Jean Roach, now the leader of the group advocating for Peltier's release. She remembers Leonard playing a huge role in keeping her family safe. Me and my little brother was there with a lot of other people. Most of us were under the age of 18 and um, Leonard saved our lives. Leonard, Bob and Dino, you know, our camp was attacked by the FBI. They didn't care that we had women, children, grandma and grandpa there. They just came in, you know, all crazy like. In 2017, a senior U.S. attorney involved in the case urged President Barack Obama to give Peltier clemency. Presidents Bill Clinton, George W. Bush and Donald Trump also faced similar pushes to act on Peltier's case, but none did. Last November, seven U.S. senators wrote to President Biden asking him to commute Peltier's sentence. Still, though, nothing has changed. His case has been a human rights issue taken on by advocates both within the U.S. and abroad, including Pope Francis, the Dalai Lama, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, and Mother Teresa. Last summer, the U.N. Human Rights Council's Working Group on Arbitrary Detention wrote to the U.S. government calling Peltier's imprisonment arbitrary. They asked for his immediate release and compensation for his time in jail and gave the U.S. government six months to show what it's done to address the issues they laid out. That six-month window ended in late January, and it's unclear as of yet how or if the government responded. Joining us now is Kevin Sharp. He's a former federal judge who is currently the vice chair of the Sanford Heisler Sharp Law Firm. He's working pro bono as Leonard Peltier's attorney. Kevin, thank you so, so much for joining us. First of all, um, how is Leonard doing, and how does that play a role in the most recent push to seek clemency? It's interesting you ask how he is because it's a different response when you're asking how somebody on the outside is, right? You, you have to put into, into context that he's 78 years old and has, is going into his 48th year of incarceration in a maximum security prison. So you take all of those maladies that a 78-year-old man will have, and now you put it in that kind of environment, and so it gets exacerbated. COVID is bad enough, but now get COVID in a maximum security prison without the health care that you or and I could get access to in the event we need it. And it, and it makes this much worse. You know, you, you've, he's got diabetes. Um, he's got an aortic aneurysm that could kill you at any time. You know, he's got heart issues. You take all of those and put them in a maximum security prison. You know, I don't, I don't know how much longer he's got and how much longer he can do this. And that's what makes this push so much more important and urgent that we've got to get him free to give him at least some time uh, before he passes on to see his children and his grandchildren and his great grandchildren and have some last, you know, bit of freedom before he's gone. How exactly does his condition play a role in in seeking clemency? Is this something that um, you are highlighting to the powers that be as a way to, um, you, know, you know, maybe speed up the process? Yes, it is, because all of those legal items that we've known about for decades, right? We've known about the misconduct. We've known about the threats and intimidations of witnesses. I'm going back now to the trial in 1977. We know about 
the hidden ballistics test that showed he was not the shooter, right? We know about the the threats uh, against the uh, the woman Myrtle Corbear, who was threatened and signed an affidavit to get Leonard extradited from Canada, saying that she was his girlfriend. She was there that day. She saw him murder two agents. We now know, and Myrtle has since, um, shortly after that, um, admitted that none of that was true, right? So this, the, all of these things we have known about, the courts have known about it, the president has known about it, the pardon attorney has known about it. So all of those those items are still there that counsel toward clemency. Let's end this. Half a century, a, a lot of presidential administrations have, have come and gone. Um, why do you think that this is a decision that neither President Biden or previous presidents have already made? Well, I think because it's politics. People call Leonard a political prisoner. That means a lot of different things to different people, right? That's a, those are, that's a phrase that um, is loaded with a, with a lot of different a lot of different baggage to it. But he's certainly a prisoner of politics. You don't want to be called the guy who's soft on crime. It means that you're going to have to oppose the FBI's narrative of this, and that's tough to do. But I think a lot has changed. The audience is ready to listen to that. We now know things about law enforcement. It doesn't have the same shine that it once did. We know that now that they are people, or at least we're able to recognize it. We always knew that. But we're able to recognize that they're people, and they do bad things, and they need to be held accountable for that. We also have an audience that's willing to, to listen to the narrative about the treatment of Native Americans in this country, right? Because 19, that June 1975 didn't just happen in a vacuum. That place was a powder keg, and there were 400 years of, of history and mistreatment that led up to that day. Kevin Sharp is the vice chair of the Sanford Heisler Sharp Law Firm and Leonard Peltier's attorney. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for talking about these issues. I appreciate it.